Hello and welcome to Irish Pregnancy and Birth with me, Carolyn Coughlin. I'm a self-employed community midwife working in the Dublin Midlandster area. The mission of this podcast is to empower pregnant women with the most up-to-date information on all things pregnancy and birth by interviewing maternity healthcare professionals on a different topic every episode. For our pilot show, we're incredibly lucky to have with us one of the most influential midwives in Ireland, Professor of Midwifery in Trinity College, Dublin, Professor Cecily Begley. Professor Begley has led many research teams to successful completion of diverse projects, focusing mainly on physiological childbirth, women-centered maternity care, care of women with disabilities, advanced and specialist practice, and self-esteem, assertiveness in student nurses and midwives. She is an editorial advisor on the BMC Pregnancy and Childbirth Journal, has editorial and reviewing commitments to four other medical nursing and midwifery journals, and is published widely on nursing and midwifery clinical and educational issues. A full list of her achievements will be longer than the show itself, but I hope you get a sense of how accomplished she is in the field of midwifery. Professor Begley taught me when I was doing my higher diploma in midwifery over 10 years ago, and she has been a real source of inspiration to me in my career because of her commitment to evidence-based practice and her advocacy for women in childbirth, and her determination to advance the practice of midwifery in Ireland and beyond. So uh, you're very welcome, Cecily. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, so Trinity College has recently launched Journey to Birth, a free online antenatal course for women navigating pregnancy through this pandemic. It's a fantastic project which really meets the needs in a difficult time. This is a course which you spearheaded from the start. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Sure. It's a six-week course and women can access it online. It's supposed to take about two hours of work per week, although I think if people throw themselves into it, it takes a little bit longer. The germ of the idea came from our REDUCE study, which we were doing um, in the Rotunda Hospital. This is a pilot study aimed at developing an intervention to try and reduce cesarean sections, which are escalating all the time and are far too high, according to the World Health Organization. So part of the intervention is to um, provide education for women, information on all kinds of aspects of preparing for labor and birth, so that they may be more likely to have vaginal births. Um, because of COVID and also because we got more funding from the Health Research Board, we developed this also into an online course. It started as a very short course with just a few videos funded by the HRB and then we decided we needed to go the whole hog and, and develop a full program. So that launched a week ago and we already have over a thousand women on it, which is brilliant. Great. And um, have, what has the response been like from the users? Um, very positive. We had um, one comment that made us change one of the little pieces we had, which is fantastic. It's great to get feedback from women to, to improve it. Um, and all the other comments have been positive. But it's just the first week. So they're, they're introducing themselves. Um, a lot of them are stating their feelings and so forth. And I'm always uh, really saddened when I find that women are so afraid of childbirth and so anxious about it. And I hope that when they work through the six weeks of the course that they'll, they'll be less anxious and hopefully their fears will be alleviated as well. That's fantastic. Um, do you, the, the pandemic has created a lot of difficulties for pregnant women. Are there other strategies do you think that uh, we could use to support women during this difficult time? Oh, look, I'm so sorry for them because it's, you know, they're so, so anxious about it. Yeah. And I don't think our health service has been terribly helpful in, in the beginning stages because they were overwhelmed and everybody was terrified and didn't know what to do for the, for the, for the right. But um, unfortunately, some hospitals in Ireland and across the world uh, did things like uh, refusing to allow partners to come in with the women in labor so they had no support um, or you know, make, making women wear masks or gowns or gloves or something else in case they had COVID-19. And thankfully, all of that has gone so far as I'm aware in Ireland and now every um, one of the hospitals allows women to have a partner with them in labor. The trouble is most of them then have to go home within an hour or so. And again, that's, that's sad because it's lovely to be together for a good few hours and women need the support, particularly women who had a cesarean section and they're not able to get out of the bed to get the baby. They need somebody with them to help mind the baby because the staff are usually so overpressed. So I think women have had a, a lot of strain to put up with during this time mainly worrying about you know what will happen in labour and, and what they will be allowed or not allowed to do but also when they attend for antenatal care 
it's quite frightening to go into a hospital at this time, I think, and to see people with, with masks and all the precautions they have to take and so on. But I think women in Ireland, certainly, and in many other countries where COVID-19 is decreasing, that um, I, th I think we're beginning to realise, you know, the worst of the pandemic is over. And so long as we take all the precautions, we're all going to be OK. Um, are there any other online courses in the area of maternity that you would like to roll out? Oh, wow. Well, we've done a lot recently. Deirdre Daly, my colleague who leads the MAMI study, has produced three um, courses. QAM is the best known one, which is undergoing its second iteration at the moment. And it's also always available on our mammy.ie uh, study site. And that's women's health after motherhood. And that includes videos and talks and discussions and articles about um, women's physical and emotional health after they've had a baby. And it's a really, really useful site for women. We also have messages and on track, which are other varieties of um, information for women that's online. That's great. Um, so I was at a conference in February in Crow Park uh, where you gave a talk on promoting uh, normality in childbirth. I really enjoyed it and, you said, and I took a lot from it. Um, can you tell people what we mean by the term normalizing childbirth and why it is something that is important? Yeah, okay. Well, childbirth is a normal physiological process, okay, and some people welcome that and embrace it and think that's fantastic. Um, others, you know, don't like this term. They think it's, it's denying all the various changes that happen in a woman's body, but they are normal changes. It's like deciding you're going to run a marathon, and then, of course, you might get blisters or you might injure your knee while you're training or whatever. These things happen, but it's part of normal life. In general, the majority of women are normal and healthy. Certainly 50% of them have no complications or issues or any problems that would mean that they need to see a doctor at all during pregnancy. And those are the women who are very suitable to attend midwife-led care or birthing centers or to have babies at home. So when I'm talking about normalizing childbirth, it's to encourage those women who are normal and healthy to, to continue to be normal and healthy. They don't need to go to hospital necessarily. They don't need to see a doctor. They need to register with a midwife and then have care in whatever setting they feel most comfortable in. And the national maternity strategy that was developed a few years ago in Ireland is heading that direction. This is what it says should be happening. And none of that has been put in place yet in Ireland. Normalizing childbirth also applies to women who have problems. So starting with the very basic things like gestational diabetes. A lot of women will develop that. That doesn't mean you're a diabetic. It means that um, you're having slight issues controlling blood sugar. And so long as you follow the recommendations for diet um, and have blood sugar tested whenever is recommended for you, you're perfectly okay and your baby will be perfectly okay. But we then need to keep that no everything else normal there's no reason why a woman who has gestational diabetes or mild preeclampsia or any of the other little things that can arise in pregnancy, there's no reason why she can't go on to a perfectly normal pregnancy, labor and birth. And that should be promoted all the way through. It doesn't mean she has to be in hospital and be monitored and have drips and have the baby taken away and brought to the baby unit or whatever. None of those things are necessary yet. Okay. So the whole idea of normalization is to keep things as normal as possible for as long as possible. And then any time that an issue arises, we treat that issue. And then we go back to trying to care for the woman along the lines of normality for all the other parts of her care. Mm -hmm. So is there any advice you'd give to women to avoid an overly medicalized birthing experience? Uh, be calm, be confident, be empowered, know as much as you possibly can about labour and birth. Because then if you know the literature and you know the research, you can remind the people who are looking after you that this is the way you want your care to be. And this is the reason why you want it to be like that. And once you're confident and sure of your position, you will go on and have perfectly normal birth. Lovely. Um, so the term cascade of interventions is one of, that midwives often refer to. Can you explain what the term in practical terms means and how it might be avoided? Yeah. What happens when, when birth is normal and physiological, you're producing oxytocin all the time. And that's what keeps your labor going. It stimulates the contractions and eventually helps you push the baby out and then helps your body produce breast milk and, and expel it. 
So oxytocin needs to be preserved all the way through labor. And the way we professionals don't preserve it is we frighten women very, very gently and slowly all the way through their labor. And every time we frighten a woman, she gets a little jolt of adrenaline, which decreases the oxytocin. So the first thing we do is make her come into hospital in the first place. So she has the stress of traveling in a car, shouting at the husband to go faster or to slow down or to take care or whatever it is. By the time she comes in, quite often the contractions have stopped because the oxytocin has been so damped down. And then she's told things like, oh, well, you're not really in labor. Uh, or she's told, you know, you came in too soon, which is probably not true. But, um, you know, the act of coming in has stopped the labor. So she has to get over that hurdle. It takes about an hour, two hours for her labor to start up again. In the meantime, if she's examined again an hour or two after she's come in, the healthcare professionals may say that, oh, well, you haven't dilated anymore. Your cervix hasn't opened anymore because the contraction stopped, because we frightened away the oxytocin. And then they say, okay, well, what we should do is rupture your membranes, let the water that's around the baby drain out, and then put up a drip of oxytocin to start your labor off again. Now, that's one way of doing it, but the other way is to let the woman rest and be calm, sleep if she wants to, in a nice, quiet, dark place to allow her oxytocin to come back into play again. Maybe all she needs is a break. Her body might need an hour's sleep and then suddenly the contractions will start up and she'll go on in normal labor again. But we don't, we put in this intervention of oxytocin and rupturing membranes. Her labor starts back again quite strongly because once the membranes are ruptured, the uterus, the womb is irritated by the baby touching it now from inside and that makes contractions stronger and a bit more painful. Oxytocin in a drip in your arm makes the contractions stronger and more painful. So after a while, this woman who maybe didn't want any analgesic sick and wanted to breathe and practice hypnobirthing or be in water to help, to help her manage the, the pain in the contractions. Maybe she gets a little bit out of control and a little bit tired and a little bit fussed and says, oh, I must have an epidural. So they give her an epidural. Because of that, the contractions stop again. And also quite often the baby gets a little bit distressed at that stage. And then she starts having tests to see how distressed the baby is. And um, if the clinicians feel that, you know, the labor is uh, going to be too long and the baby is too distressed at this stage, she ends up with a forceps birth or a cesarean section. And that's the cascade of intervention. Once you have one intervention, it leads on to another and another and another. So the best thing is to try and avoid the first ones, if possible. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um... So one aspect of birth that is often overlooked by popular culture is the third stage labour where the placenta is birthed and is very important. Um, you've researched this in great depth. Um, would you like, what would you like women to know about the third stage of labour? Well, it's a very important stage of labour that women and clinicians quite often ignore. Women ignore it because, you know, they've just had a baby and there's a baby there being cuddled and loved and hugged and then suddenly the midwife is going, will you give a push or we're going to give you an injection and they're going, what's happening, you know, it's very easy to forget. The placenta is, or is the afterbirth, it's the bit that kept the baby alive all the way through your pregnancy. And um, what happens, the minute the baby is born, your uterus shrinks right down and the placenta starts separating away. It's, it's, your placenta is actually grown into the wall of your uterus, it's embedded in, but because your uterus contracts, it starts peeling away. And because of that, there's a little bit of blood loss behind. So once the placenta has separated away, which takes about five minutes, you'll actually feel it drop down into the bottom part of your uterus and you might feel a little bit of pressure or like you want to go to the toilet and you can just give a push and the placenta falls out. So that's when it happens normally, that's your, your body does all this. Um, you bleed about 250 mLs, which is um, you know, about this much in a, in a, in a, in a bottle. <laughs> um, it's not a huge amount, it probably looks like a lot if it's all over the floor. Um, there are two ways you can birth your placenta. One is the normal way that I've just talked about, and the other is to have an injection called um, syntocinin. It's the same synthetic oxytocin that made you have contractions if it was put in a drip. Uh, if that's given just after the baby's born, you will have the placenta about three to five minutes faster, and you will bleed about 50 mLs less. So 
you know, the way it'll be said to you is, you know, we, want, we would like to give you this injection now to speed up the afterbirth and to, so that you won't hemorrhage. And a lot of women say, oh, grand, right, I'll have that. It isn't really essential. And certainly for the 50% of women that are having midwifery led care or birthing in birth centers and have had normal ordinary births, it's not essential at all. And the other thing is that that injection is always there. If you birth your placenta yourself and you start to bleed a little bit more than the midwives are happy with, they'll just give you that injection and your bleeding will stop. So it's not that you're being, you know, without the injection, <coughs> excuse me, it's not that without the injection you would bleed to death or have a big hemorrhage or anything. It's there if you need it and, and you'll be given it if you need it. So in general, uh, physiological way is best for the 50% of women who are normal and healthy. And what's also good about it is the baby's cord is left to pulsate, which sometimes goes on for 10 minutes, quarter of an hour. And what that does is it gives the baby's extra 70 mLs of blood, which was in the placenta and belongs to the baby, that's pumped into the baby before you clamp and cut the cord. If we're rushing to give the injection and to take the placenta out quickly, the midwives will clamp and cut that cord and the baby won't get that 70 mLs of blood. And that sometimes leads to a little bit of anemia later on at about three to six months. So overall, certainly the cord should be left unclamped and to pulsate. And that probably it's better not to have the injection if you're normal and healthy and all as well. Okay, yeah. Um, so two drugs often used in the active management of the third stage are syntocin and syntonatrin. Can you tell women the difference between those two drugs? Sure. Um, there's, there's only one or two hospitals in Ireland that use Sintometrin now, and all the rest use Sintocin, but it's good to ask and to try and find out. Sintocin is the oxytocin, the one that causes contractions and relaxation of the, the muscle of the uterus. Sintometrin also contains ergometrine as well as Sintocin. And ergometrine is a really old drug. It's the first one that was ever discovered back in 1945 that would contract the uterus and it was fantastic because it saved lives back then you know by controlling hemorrhage but it's a very very severe drug it causes severe abdominal pain and you may actually need an injection to control the pain if you have it on its own and it can raise your blood pressure and it can make you feel quite nauseated and it can make you vomit so there's quite a lot of side effects some of those are decreased when it's mixed with syntocin and that's why that's the usual way to give it now. It'd be very seldom that we would give ergometry now, except in an emergency if someone was bleeding a lot. So some hospitals prefer syntometrine. They, they like the combination of the two drugs. Um, it may be a little bit more uncomfortable for you and you may feel nauseated and, and vomit. It also possibly will make it a little bit harder for you to breastfeed in the first week but the, the, those effects wear off as, as you continue on breastfeeding, if you're able to persevere and work through it. And the reason for that is that ergometrine decreases prolactin levels, which that's the hormone that produces breast milk. So in general, syntocin is better. It's the World Health Organization has said this is the drug that should be used at the moment. Great, thank you, Cecily. Um, so the placenta has spent nine months nourishing your child, and yet most women leave their placentas in hospital to dispose of. But there are a number of other options. Is there anything you would suggest that women might do with their placentas after birth? Oh, wow. <laughs> you no, know, in New Zealand, a lot of the Maori women, they always bury their placenta. Um, and there's a special hill, you know, in one part of New Zealand where they would come every year. They keep the placentas frozen, you know, if they've had babies during the year. And then there's a day they all travel up to this hill and bury their placentas. Um, but some women like to bury it in, in the garden with a tree over it or, or whatever. Um, some women like to eat it, and there's certainly good rationale for that. Uh, it might sound disgusting, but um, it's full of hormones, and it is said that if you eat your placenta, that you're less likely to get postnatal depression because you're sort of getting some of your hormones back again. Because depression, or certainly the baby blues at three days, is because you get this big hormone dip. Um, I don't know. Is there anything else you can do? You can have it cast in in uh, plastic or something to look pretty. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, you can you can get are there any other things? <laughs> you can get a print of it or you can get it made into uh capsules and tinctures and oh um, yes, yes, yes. That's yeah, the yeah. ones again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it might might be more palatable than, than eating it fried with onions, which is what people usually do. 
Yeah, or some people, some of my women that I've looked after have uh, chopped it up into little pieces and frozen it in little bags and then taken some out and just made smoothies every morning. Yeah, yeah. And eating yeah. it raw as well. And did you find that they were less depressed or did they feel it helped? Um, yeah, I think a lot of women get a kind of a bit of energy from it. They feel they kind of get a little bit of a lift, you know, that's kind of what I've heard from women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, the main thing is it's your placenta, you know, the hospital is, doesn't have to keep it or isn't allowed to keep it if you don't want them to mm -hmm. at home, for sure. Yeah, and it's important that women are aware of that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I've come to the end of the questions I've prepared. Is there anything else that you would like to talk about today? Oh, sure. If you gave me an open invitation, I'd go on for hours. I don't think so. I mean, I just say to any women looking at this is, you know, pregnancy is really normal just enjoy it take pleasure in it learn as much as you can about labor and birth and then you'll go into it calm and confident and happy and i hope you have lovely births because when you have a lovely birth it's really lovely thank you Cecily. that's so lovely so i'm so grateful for having you on today um i'd like to recommend people to register for a journey to birth course which can be found at futurelearn.com it's a fantastic resource I'd also like to thank everyone for um, everything you've done to promote normality in birth and in, in Ireland and beyond, and for being an inspiration to everyone looking to promote best practice in midwifery. So that was Cecily Begley, one of Ireland's most influential midwives. I'll be back soon with another episode, so keep an eye on my website, dublinhomebirth.com, or my Instagram and Twitter and Facebook pages at Dublin Home Birth. I've been your host and midwife, Carolyn Coughlin. I hope you've enjoyed the show.